you know, these are these are reminders that we are in a war that's real. Yes, it is a war. In a battle with an enemy who is not visible. Mm -hmm. And he battles with us right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, tonight we are going to uh, progress a little bit further and look at this battle mm -hmm. between the kingdom of the heavens and the kingdom of God. But, but don't make the mistake now, and I want to say this, and we're not going to get to this for a few minutes yet, but God's not in a battle with anybody. He's absolutely God Almighty. But you and I are as residents of His earth here, tied to these physical bodies that we have. We are in a battle with the enemy. And learning to discern when the enemy's coming is really, really important for us. And He would love nothing better than for you to close your Bible and go away and forget all about this. Like uh, one of the few times when I was dealing with someone where one of these unclean spirits was so strong that it was actually speaking through the voice of the person who was there. And it was, a, it was an altered voice. It wasn't even this guy's voice. But they said, we're not in here. <laughs> kept telling them, come out in Jesus' name. He's to be free in Jesus. We're not in here. We're, we're not in here. Okay, well, that's, that's what the enemy would love to mention. And it, and it manifests in many different forms. And, and uh, you know, wherever you are in your understanding tonight, it's my desire that we move a little bit further along in understanding and get some of the bigger pictures of what's going on. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. What I was going to add to that is that a couple of years ago, you know, I was thinking how every, day, every time somebody does something, they're doing it, they're, there's something they're getting out of. So I remember saying one day, what does the enemy get out of it? I mean, what is his motive for attacking us? And because nobody really ever talks about what is the motive. You know, what is his <coughs> sensing? What does he get out of it? And the Lord showed me one day that he is forever, forever condemned. There is nothing he can do to ever obtain grace, mercy, love, nothing. And it made me realize the hatred he has for God because of that which was of his own doing. That's of his own doing. That's right. So who does he right. take out his hatred to God? To God those but that God loves. God's treasure. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so he attacks us, not because he cares to attack us, because it's getting to God. Exactly. And it really opened up my eyes because I was realizing he sees us, you know, here, messing up, doing stuff, but we get crazy mercy. No. He will never get that. Right. And we don't understand the whole dynamics because right. of what he did was in a far different level than we can even grasp. But it made me realize that there's a thing is he's not looking at me like, oh, I'm going to get you know, He's looking at me as if I attack her. You know, like, I don't, I, I rescue dogs. If somebody no. kicks my dog, they're kicking me. And they're going to make me. And we, and we do, you know, we do know the scripture says of Satan that he's the accuser. Of the brethren. That's what he did, yes. And he was trying right. to, yes. And, it, and Scripture says it. he accuses mm -hmm. the followers of the Lord, mm -hmm. his disciples, before the Father day and night. Look what Sharon did. Look what Adrian did. Look what Rick did. You know? and, and, that, and, and of course we have to remember, see God's not willing that any should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance and, and to turn to him. But for those that don't, they're going to be cast into, and the Bible says, hell that is prepared for the devil and his angels. So you see, we're kind of on the peripheral of an ongoing issue that's, that's been happening. But we need to be wise and discerning about that and not be naive. Just because we don't see these creatures, uh, let's not uh, buy into this thing that they don't exist because Jesus invested a lot of energy and effort in Thank you for that. Uh, yes. One more thing, Rick, on that. You said, you, you kept telling me, don't buy into the lie. And he was a lying demon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he said, don't buy into that lie, because he wasn't with all this stuff. See, I've been healed mm -hmm. of, of atrial fibrillation, and I went backward. I thought. He lied. he lied to me, and he said, don't buy into that. Don't buy into right. that. And that's. That again is you can't buy into his lies. Right. And the warfare, the battle zone, uh -huh. is right here. The Bible describes it for us. And, uh, and we are going to get a little further into some of those things. Uh, uh, 
probably not specifically tonight, but, but fairly soon. Um, there's one thing I wanted to show you. I wanted to lean on uh, uh, Dennis Prager and Prager University tonight. Uh, there's an economist, Dr. Williams, from uh, uh, George Washington, George Mason, George Washington University. Uh, he'll tell us here in a minute. <laughs> and I think what he has to share about this is really important because we need to understand that in human history, there has never been a country that started with the foundation that our country started with. And a lot of the things that have produced freedom for Christianity and uh, that has corrected a lot of human ills, even though America has been guilty of a lot of ills too. This is not about, about perfection. It's about progress forward. And uh, many of the basic things that have caused America to be different and to give liberty and freedom where it never had been before are under, under assault. And uh, one of God's principles is that the laborer is worthy of his hire. In fact, the scripture gives instruction in, in uh, Jesus' time, uh, a man who hired people paid them every day. And, uh, and the Bible specifically addresses that. The workman is worthy and you pay him his due. And uh, what's under attack today in America is called profit. And, it's, and it has been impugned as something evil. Dr. Williams, in a, in a very brief segment here, uh, addresses this. And I, I just feel compelled to share this with you before we press on our study about uh, about the attacks of the enemy because part of what the enemy wants to do is he wants to make America like most countries in the world. And many that speak that think that that would be an improvement. But they don't understand the real world. Amen. Uh, Amen. And you know, uh, I, I could go on a long time about that, but let's just hear what Dr. Williams shares about this. And I think that you'll be... Uh, you'll be <laughs> What's progress? And why is it so important to everyone, not just business owners and entrepreneurs? Here's a simple quiz. When you spend $100 on a new pair of shoes, does the shop owner get to keep that $100? The answer, of course, is no. The shop owner has to pay all of his business costs, employee salaries, inventory, rent, supplies, taxes, and a dozen other expenses. His profit is what's left over. It's his payment for the time and money he spent and the risks that he's taken to keep his business going. Thank goodness for profits. Profits motivate people to work hard for themselves and make life better for others. Take the example of Bill Gates. How did he become so wealthy? The answer is that he came up with something that millions of people so wanted and needed that they reached into their pockets to pay for it. His Windows operating system, Word software, and other Microsoft products. What's more, he produced these products in a way that efficiently used resources. And what motivated him? And just about every other successful entrepreneur to work so hard, the answer is profits. Without the incentive of profits, why would anyone spend his savings or countless hours and take all the risks necessary to bring their product or service to the marketplace? There's a simple answer, they wouldn't. You don't have to make billions like Bill Gates. Take a Montana cattle rancher who goes out in the dead of winter, even in blizzards to feed his cows, to keep them safe and care for them, making huge personal sacrifices so that New Yorkers can sit down to eat a nice steak. Why does the rancher do that? Do you think he does it because he loves New Yorkers? <laughs> of course not. The rancher tends to his cattle because he wants more for himself and his family. He wants profits. You can go to the supermarket any day of the week, and if you want steak, they have it. If you want potatoes, they have them. Sugar, salt, potato chips, strawberries, peanut butter, they have it. In fact, the average well-stocked supermarket in the United States has over 50,000 different items on its shelves. How does all that get there? It seems like magic, but it's not. 
Every one of those items is on the shelves thanks to one thing, profit. The same holds true for the device you're watching this video course on. Whether it's a TV, a desktop or laptop computer, a smartphone, or a tablet. And for every component in those devices. They all exist as millions of other products we treasure and depend upon exist because of the profit motive. No profit and it all goes away. Here's another reason the profit motive is so important. Ask yourself this question. Which establishments do you tend to be most dissatisfied with? The answer is likely to be government agencies. Why? Because they don't operate for profit. So no one is rewarded for good work and almost no one is ever punished for inferior work. And which establishments are you most satisfied with? The answer is likely to be the ones that operate on a for-profit basis. If I'm unhappy with, say, a department store like Macy's or Bloomingdale's because it's not providing me with the goods or services that I want, I can, in essence, fire that store by taking my business elsewhere. But consider a government agency like Department of Motor Vehicles or public schools. If I'm frustrated with their performance, I can't fire them because I don't have many alternatives. Business owners must please their customers or risk failure and bankruptcy. Government agencies risk nothing and therefore have to please no one. Am I saying we don't need government? That everything should be on a for-profit basis? Of course not. But what I am saying is that we should want as little government as possible. That's exactly what the founding fathers of our nation believed. They understood that the profit motive pushes people to do extraordinary things. Take that motivation away and the world becomes a very different and darker place. I'm Walter Williams of George Mason University or Prager University. Join Prager University. Click here to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click here to sign up for free at PragerU.com for quizzes, contests, and prizes. So, I, I hope you find that enlightening, that simple little explanation. Uh, the profit motive is actually what has driven America to achieve more than any country in the history of the world. And it's because of liberty and freedom. And uh, the opportunity, the opportunity to take a risk for the possibility of having success. A lot of times, businesses fail. In fact, uh, small businesses, uh, I think within five years, something like 60% of all small businesses fail because they don't manage to get over some of these challenges that are, that are there. And, uh, and so understanding that that's what provides uh, availability for us here. Uh, don't be duped into thinking that profit is something evil. Because it's not. It's actually what has driven America to become the greatest nation in the world. <clears throat> now, I'll give you one other little illustration uh, that, I, that I think might be worthy uh, for you tonight. Because uh, I, I, I thought about this from a number of different angles, and I had to change my view. Uh, but an illustration for you about, uh, about uh, what really happens with, uh, with supply and demand. <coughs> Let's say this is a let's say this is a store on the Gulf Coast somewhere, and a uh, and a hurricane is coming, and there's going to be short supply. And those who've lived on the Gulf Coast have learned all too well uh, the kinds of things that are in short supply. You hear stories about how a two-pack of batteries that was five dollars is now thirty dollars. You say, well, isn't that evil? The profit motive—they're taking advantage of. Uh, and I would have agreed with you until about five or six years ago when I began to understand economically what really happens. When the storekeeper knows that his supply is going to go and that everybody needs it, 
And he raises the price from $5 for the two-pack of batteries, $30, say. Here's what happens. The person comes into the store and they go, well, that's ridiculous. I, I need batteries for my flashlight. They should only be $5. Why are you charging me $30? Well, there aren't going to be any more. When these are gone, that's it. So that's the price. So the person buys only the batteries they really need. And what that does is that guarantees the supply to be available to other people who are going to need those batteries too. So the person only buys what they really need. If the price was still $5 for, for two or a four pack of batteries, then the person who comes in might spend the $30 and buy six packages of them instead of just what they need, which means that the, the next person who comes in, there aren't any batteries left for them. That's the genius of supply and demand. <coughs> When it's allowed to float free, then people will only buy that which they really need, which assures a greater supply available for other people who are in need of something uh, like that as well. So when, uh, for example, in, the in, in, in countries where the government sets the prices on, on things, for example, you go to the stores and the shelves are empty because when a load of lettuce comes in, they can only have a certain amount of lettuce. People line up so they can all buy the heads of lettuce and then the lettuce is all gone. But that's because the price is artificially low because the government says you can only charge a dollar for this head of lettuce. When the reality is that in order to cover all of the costs, that lettuce should be costing $3 a head, but the government won't let them charge that. So the end result is shortages everywhere that you go. That's the genius of this uh, free market system. Now, the problem is that in my lifetime, there's been very little genuine free market in America. And you have to kind of know the history to go back and see where, for example, the reason we have the problem in the medical area where we are now is because the government stuck its nose where they shouldn't and thinking that they could control inflation, they put a wage freeze on workers all across America. You could not raise anyone's wages. Well, the companies that were trying to keep the best employees were trying to come up with some way to keep them, they said, you know what we'll do? We can't raise your wages. The government won't let us do that. We'll compensate you in other ways. We'll buy your medical care for you. And this is back in the 40s when the government thought they could solve the problem of inflation by artificially enforcing it. And the end result is the medical issues and the, and the high cost of, of uh, medical care that we have in America today. That's one of the results. I recently had to go see a dermatologist and I paid cash because I don't have any health insurance. Can't afford it. I, you know, in my, in my little business, we, we can't afford to buy it. And um, so I went in and my visit was $60. Somehow they didn't mark that I had paid that and I got a bill from their billing uh, center. Guess how much the visit would have been if I had health insurance? Three hundred and eighty dollars. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And I paid sixty bucks. Mm -hmm. Now, part of the reason is because the greater expense, because of health insurance, because there's so many stinking forms and paperwork. They have to hire people that do nothing. They probably have just about as many people working on the paperwork yeah. mm -hmm. as providing the medical care in the offices. Amen. And you can Amen. trace. This is not real free market. You can trace the problem back. To the government thinking that they could solve problems by doing things like price freezes. Okay, I'm not an, an economist, and I know this is a very, very much an oversimplification, but I just want you to be thinking and realizing that God's desire for all of us is total freedom. Amen. Amen. And, and the world over countries, very few of them, give real freedom to their people. I get frustrated with government interference in my business. Amen. You can't Amen. believe how many hours are spent every month not 
providing better customer service to our customers, but satisfying the regulators on all different levels. The city government, the county government, the state government, the federal government, it, it affects, uh, and, and because my wife's in the office, she probably spends at least one third of her time not taking care of customers' needs and making us a better and more responsive business, but satisfying the obligations of paperwork to the government. I'm just simply saying that this is a system that God has an affinity for. And if somebody, if there's no price constraint, they can ask any price they want. And you can simply say, no thanks. You don't have to buy it. Figure out a way to get around it. And, uh, and there are many, many examples where that's exactly what's taking place. So uh, I just wanted to urge you to not be naive in your thinking. And maybe some assumptions that you've made about profit being evil, then maybe you ought to step back and, and rethink that. And in the scripture, what God says is this. And there's a specific answer that Paul gives where a couple says, we're going to such and such a city. We're going to buy and sell and get gain. And what Paul addressed was not that they're going to get a profit that they were planning for, but they said, all of your planning should be yielded to God. And instead you should say, if God is willing, we'll go into such and such a city and buy and sell and gain a profit, a reward for the efforts that were made. So, um, with that in mind now, um, you can meditate and think on that. Uh, by the way, I just do have to mention this to you because I was just delighted today. Um, Dennis Prager has a new book out, and I, I do, actually don't remember the name of it, but it's a book about the Ten Commandments. And, oh, thank you, brother. Appreciate that. It's a book about the Ten Commandments, but the one thing that I'm especially delighted about is one of the commandments where I've expressed what my understanding about it is. Dennis Prager is the only other person that I've encountered who saw the very same thing, who was a, who was a Bible teacher. And it's about the commandment about not taking the name of the Lord in vain. And in his book, he addresses that. Some of us have thought and assumed that that man, when you invoke God's name, when you're angry and you're cursing. But that's not really what that commandment is about. And uh, that commandment is about people saying, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm spirit-filled, I'm serving God, and then they go act like the devil does and act like the world does. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. And one of the things that, that I happened to catch him pointing out, the Hebrew literally says to take along with you the name of God in vain. That's literally what that commandment says. Taking along with you the name of the Lord. I am spirit filled. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm born again. Whatever terminology you might use. And yet, you walk and talk and act like the world does. That is the commandment that's prohibited by God. Taking long the name of the Lord in vain when you're not bearing the fruit of righteousness that He's calling us to. So, uh, you might just investigate that a little bit further. I, I, apparently, it's a fairly small booklet. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> and uh, I think, uh, I'm sure there'll probably be some things in there with which I do not agree, but that, that's beside the point. The point is that we're seeking for more life and understanding from God. I'm not asking you to agree with everything that I say. I just uh, urge you to keep seeking for more life and for more understanding. So, again, I'm using this terminology, the kingdom of the heavens, from the standpoint of the, your understanding. We're not talking about the throne room of God in the future. We're talking about the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, that's at work right in this room, right in your home, right where you work and live every day. That's what we're talking about. The kingdom of the heavens versus the kingdom of darkness. But let's start out in uh, Proverbs, if you would join me there. You open the Bible to the middle, they usually get Psalms turned right, and you'll find Proverbs. The fourth proverb. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. There's a, there's a lot of information in the Scripture that contrasts light with darkness. 
Jesus, as you may recall, uh, in fact, I don't think I have it on the list, but you're familiar with it, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And uh, we're, we're going to read some references to that advent of God coming into physical human body. And uh, the contrast is light with darkness. Proverbs 4, verse 18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. That's what the path of the righteous is like. It's like the light of the dawn. So if some of you through our times of studying together are gaining some insight you haven't had before and gaining some understanding you haven't had before, then understand it's that dawn where more understanding of God's Word draws us into more light. The path is getting lighter and lighter or, and brighter and brighter is, is actually what it says. But by the way, the contrast with that in verse 19, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And so that's the comparison. In the kingdom of the heavens, we're walking in the light and the more we walk with Him, the clearer and the brighter the light becomes. Then when you're walking in the kingdom of darkness and controlled by the powers of darkness, you're going to stumble along the way and not even realize what's going on around you. So this comparison of this war, uh, light and darkness, is continued over here in the Gospel of John. If you go to John 1, that's Big John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, first chapter. And uh, John is describing for us this experience of uh, Jesus the Christ coming, the Messiah coming, and uh, taking His place here in this world and giving us guidance in the direction of the things of God. Uh, and we just read the whole thing. I'm mostly writing down for you the, uh, the verses of emphasis. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know that he's talking about Jesus. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being by Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. And in Him, in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. And so this idea of revelation of understanding, of wisdom and knowledge is, you, you, you know the cartoon characters where the light bulb comes on their head? Ding! Light. Well, that's what's happening with this. As we read and study the Scriptures, the light comes on and things get clearer and we have greater understanding of what's going on. And in fact, we can even look back on our life and go, oh, now I see what was going on. Now I see why these things happen this way. And by the way, a lot of times, it was the kingdom of darkness scheming against you to destroy your life. But all the while, you look back and you go, why did that car miss me where I probably would have been killed? Why did this happen the way that it did? You know, one of the... You know, I talked to you last week and I read for you some of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said as a... Last Thursday marked 70 years since he was executed by the Nazis. He was a great theologian. He loved the Word of God. And when, when you go back and see tragically how things ended, if he had managed to survive two more weeks, Hitler and his men, they killed themselves, the ones who were left. And he would have been free. But Hitler was this petty, vindictive person and he especially wanted to get Bonhoeffer because he had, he had stood against Hitler when they tried to take over the German churches with the Nazi thinking that certain people were not welcome, they were subhuman, they, were not, they couldn't be allowed to be, to be in there. And, and he was a part of the movement to stop that from going forward. 
And of course, as I mentioned, he came to America and was actually offered a, a teaching position in the United States. But before he went and took that teaching position, he really felt compelled of God to go back to Germany and stand against this evil. He said, because this is evil of the worst kind and we have to do everything that's in our power to stop this, including he was committed personally to killing Hitler and would have done it had he had the opportunity to do it. Well, the strange thing that happened was because of the Allied bombing, the prison where they were uh, was uh, collapsing on itself and they took 15 people. And this is in, uh, this is in April. 1945 and they put them in this one van and there was no gasoline to be had supplying the van problem yeah because the allies shut off the uh, the resources that they had and they literally would build a fire a uh, wood fire and use the gases then to get the engine to run and they could they could go about nine or ten miles an hour it was about it and they had 15 people crammed in this little van they actually thought they were going to die in there because of the fumes from the smoke was coming back into place and they had nowhere to move. They stopped in uh, uh, Fossenburg, I believe is the name of the town. And the guards came and demanded that four people get out. And they named four. And by the way, all 15 of these people were uh, aristocrats. One was the wife of the uh, chancellor of, of Austria and a bunch of people that they wanted to pay special attention to to be sure that they got executed. But they, they called the four out. Well. Bonhoeffer was way back in the back of the van and, and he couldn't get out and someone else did. And they went on 100 miles to this other place. And the last two weeks he was in this place where the rest of his family and relatives who had all been arrested because they had been plotting to, to destroy Hitler and to stop what he was doing. And they were, they were all being held in this prison. And, uh, and on the uh, 7th of April they showed up. Two guys did because they couldn't believe that Bonhoeffer wasn't one of the four that got off at, at Fossilburg. And so they, they sent two men and they, could, they had trouble getting there because there were so many craters where the Allied bombing had destroyed all the roads and it took a long time, but they got him and they took him back. He went through on April the, uh, on April the, the 8th the mockery of the trial. And uh, at 6.30 in the morning on April the 9th, he was hanged. 1945, seven years last week. Um, what's fascinating to me about it is that if it had just been a little bit longer, he would have survived. Yeah. I really believe that the bombs missing him and other cells collapsing and, and all the things that happened, I think was God showing. Kind of like what you shared, brother, about the woman who was passing the cancer. Or the carpet says, cancer's not killing me. The word of God is. God was showing that there was, that he could have spared Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 39 years of age. But God had another plan. And here he is 100 miles away. And God said, I just wanted you to know I could set you free. But I want you to come home. You remember how John the Baptizer lost his life? Herod's being arrogant, boastful, and his stepdaughter does this dance, and he says, I'll give you whatever you want. I'm happy kingdom. She says, gosh, Mom, I don't know. I have everything I need. What should I want? Tell them all John the Baptist yet. Yeah. <laughs> because he had pointed out their sin. And so John the Baptist is down in prison, you know, hearing about Jesus and what Jesus is doing. He would send messages to them. And then one night they showed up. And he was beheaded. Why? Why was that allowed? Because God's doing something so much bigger than this life, folks. We need to understand. There's something way bigger than our little world that's going on. At 39 years of age, God took me to bomb the home. But God could have spared him. It wasn't that God's power was great. When Jesus was executed, his life was not taken from him by the religious leaders. He voluntarily laid it down. Because he had it at his disposal. 10,000 angels. Mighty in strength. Go 
and work in the kingdom of the heavens here on this earth. Powerful. Outnumbering Satan and the forces of darkness two to one. And yet he didn't call on them because he voluntarily made that sacrifice for you and for me. So what I'm saying is we see things like this happen to God-fearing people who, who think nothing of, of their own personal comfort and lay their lives down for the benefit and the help of others. He was hanged on the same day as his brother-in-law along with two other men that Hitler, through Himmler, one of the worst of the Nazis, directly gave orders, these people must be executed and we need them executed right away. Quite a few of Bonhoeffer's family then were released once Hitler, once this evil, evil man was gone. So what we need to understand is God is light. Well, by the way, you know what the driving force was? Documented and still talked about today. Do you know what the driving force was in killing off all of these selected groups of people by Hitler? He simply wanted to speed up Darwinian evolution. Now, if you think that's crazy, just go back and do some digging. Uh, go see Ben Stein's movie where, where it's not allowed to discuss that there's intelligent design behind human life and people in American institutions of learning have been fired for even discussing that possibility while that's what all the evidence is pointing to. He went to some of the places where the thousands upon thousands of people were executed, some in the most hor horrible and horrific ways. And he asked the person who's leading the tour, talking about it, saying, what was his driving force? And they come right out on camera and say, he was just speeding up the Darwinian evolutionary process. That's it. <clears throat> so you think this thing about evolution is benign? You think, that it's, uh, you think that it's not a big deal to stand up to it? You need to think again. You see, in God, there's light. <laughs> and everything in the world was made by Him. Back to John 1, verse 4. In Him was the light, and the light, and the light was the light of men. And in verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Now, I want to take just a minute. Uh, do some of you go to uh, online... Uh, online Bible study uh, and uh, 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 Bible readings and so forth. Some of, do some of y'all do that? Would you raise your hand? Some of fine. One, of, one of the really handy ones that I like is Bible Gateway. It's free and it's available. And I want to go to that just for a minute. I want to show you something that you can do here. Alright, let's go to Bible Gateway. Okay, and I'm going to put in here uh, I want to come right back to uh, uh, John 1, 4. You can put in a scripture, but let's put, uh, let me just type in light of men. And then I tell it I want to go find, oh, who changed mine to the NIV? I don't want that. When have you been using my computer? <laughs> my wife likes the NIV. No, I like the Oh, okay. Well, that's true. You do, you do really like the Apple Bible. Let me go back to the uh, New American Standard Bible. Okay, that's what I, I uh, prefer, speaking American English. Okay. Uh, let's see what it says here. Oh, sorry, we didn't find any. All right, let's just go back this way. We'll do it another way. But see, uh, this is a, uh, you, can, you can type in just a keyword, something you're going after. Let's just put in light. And uh, let's tell it to go search that. And now you got 263 references. I don't know if you can see that over in the corner. Uh, so we got 263 references. But what I'm going to do is, you'll notice this column over here on the far right. It tells you how many times that word is used in those different ones. And I'm just going to go right directly to John. Because I want to do something here and just show you how, how wonderful this is. There it is. Okay. 
Uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What does it mean the darkness did not comprehend it? I want you to notice there, you can click on in context, and it will give you the phrase right around it. Or you can click on full chapter, and it will bring up John 1. You can read the whole thing. Or you can click on other translations, which is the option that I'm going to. And look at all of these different translations that, boom, are right there available for you. More translations, and you can shake a stick at it. Okay. I want to go back to this, okay, and uh, let's just take a look at some of the others. <clears throat> the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Uh, that's in the, the old King James. Uh, American Standard Version. And the darkness apprehended it not. Isn't that interesting? Darkness couldn't capture the light. It couldn't apprehend it. Uh, the Amplified, and this really is, if you want to really get the meat, this is the one to go to. The light shine in the darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out, or absorbed it, or appropriated it, and is unreceptive to it. So, light and darkness repel one another. You can't have the two together. And that's why later on in the scripture, the Bible says that, um, that a good tree bears good fruit. And a bad tree bears bad fruit. And when people say, oh, oh, look, he comes to our church. Just ignore the bad fruit that he bears. It's okay. Just overlook it. It's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, be discerning and be wise and observe the fruit so that you might be on guard. Because where the light is, it cannot participate with darkness. Darkness can't overpower it. It can't put it out. It can't appropriate it. It's unreceptive. Amen. I, I just want to go check. These, these things are free. They're just... Bible Gateway, put it in there. You can sign up, and they have all kinds of good things going on. There are a few ads here and there with it, uh, which I don't mind at all. And sometimes I buy things from them to show them that I appreciate them providing this service for us out there. So I just wanted you to know that it's uh, these things are available for you, free, and uh, all you have to do is just go do a little dig. Meanwhile, back to the ranch. John 1, 4. And five, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not apprehend it, comprehend it, overpower it. It was repelled. The darkness was repelled by the light. There came a man from God. His name was John, and he came for a witness that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. And that's exactly where we stand. We are not the light. Jesus is the light. We come to bear witness of that light. Amen. And Amen. our life is bearing witness, hopefully bearing the good fruit, not the bad fruit. And if you are bearing bad fruit, then you know what you need to do. Repent. Let God graft in you His righteousness by the power of His Spirit. In verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Have any of you had some lights come on as we've been in Bible study over these few months? Amen. Month yeah. Amen. See, that's not me. That's, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's God's truth. It enlightens every man. Every man whose heart is open. In verse 10, he was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, of the will of the flesh, of the will of man, but of God. And oh, there's so much we could spend several hours right there. And I will sidestep that temptation. Just because we need to see a few more things about the kingdom of God and the, and the kingdom of darkness. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. If you want to turn to the right. 2 Corinthians, and we're looking at the second chapter. 
Specifically, our key verse is the 14th, but there are a few others that we're going to read here also. You remember just prior to this, we, we read a couple weeks ago, uh, this warning that, well, it, um, it's, it's a warning that Paul was giving the Corinthian church to, to not allow the enemy to take advantage of them with one of his schemes. And they, we looked at that a few weeks ago. We'll read it again here now as we're looking to arrive at uh, chapter 14. <coughs> So this is 2 Corinthians, 2 chapter, did I say first? No, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 chapter. Here's what it says. Uh, in verse 10, leading up to this, he said, But whom do you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what have I forgiven? If I have given anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For, Paul says, we are not ignorant of his schemes. You see, that's part of what we're attempting to do in these studies these days is become more aware of the schemes of the kingdom of darkness. Because whether you recognize it or not, your entire life the enemy has been scheming against you. And when you begin to understand that, you can go back and say, why was I treated this way when I was a child? Maybe by somebody you trusted, a family member. And then you begin to understand they were just using that person that was in your life as a part of the plan of the kingdom of darkness to destroy your life. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's where we can learn to bless those who do wrong to us because they have no idea that they're being driven and motivated by the powers of darkness. They really don't know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we still need to stand up to them and stop them. But they have no idea they're being driven and motivated and used by the powers of darkness. <laughs> and so, we can go back and we can see how these landmines were placed along and these, these destructive things were done to us to try to get us to give up. And folks, you haven't lost until you quit trying. <laughs> You know, in all my years of playing my, my two favorite sports, I, you know, I've played quite a few others, but, you know, played, I played cricket in Australia and played rugby and, and uh, played squash and tennis competitively in schools and everything like that. I could go back. But my two favorite, football and basketball, there was never a game that I played in that we lost. We just ran out of time. So, <laughs> Give us two more quarters. <laughs> but Rick, they're ahead by 30. I know, but we've got it figured out now. <laughs> so, this thing about this battle that we're in and understanding how if you look back on your life, you can see how the enemy brought these stumbling blocks in. And yet God's showing us a way, guiding us through the craters and those landmines. As long as when we fail, we get up and we dust ourselves off and we look to God for forgiveness and mercy. And you know what? Boom! He gives it. Amen. They, as horrible as David's sin was with Bathsheba, and it was horrible. Not just that he slept with another man's wife, but then he tried to cover it up because she got pregnant by having him sleep with her and he refused to do it because he was such a devoted warrior. He would not spend the night with his wife while his fellow soldiers were out in the field risking their lives. So he refused. So David arranges him to be abandoned on the battlefront and the Philistines killed him. And when Nathan the prophet came in and told him the parable and David didn't realize it was about him when he stood up and said, this man, whoever's done this, deserves to die. And the prophet said, David, you're the one who did it. And you remember what David's immediate response was? He fell on his face yes, and yes, said, oh yes, no, yes, I've yes. sinned. Yes, yes. And it wasn't five minutes later. It wasn't five hours later. It wasn't five days later. Immediately, God said to Nathan the prophet, tell him I forgive him. Wow. That, that's how much God wants us to repent. He wants us 
to recognize we're wrong. And He wants to forgive and He wants us to press on. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. That's yes, how much amen. God cares about us. Now, there were still consequences. Tragically, especially for David because he was the king. And a position of leadership and authority comes with greater responsibility and bigger consequences. Amen. Amen. For taking advantage of that and not doing what's right. But God immediately forgave. Him. And God will forgive you. Dust yourself off. And let's press on. Let's press on. And so, we don't want to be taken advantage of. This wasn't the one I listed for you there in 2 Corinthians 2. That's verses 10 and 11. No advantage to be taken of us by Satan. We're not ignorant of his schemes. And in verse 14, here's, here's what we're looking at. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Always leads us in triumph. Some of the people who observed Bonhoeffer, who were in the prison with him the day that he was executed, one of the men had seen a lot of people die and he said he was on his knees praying when they opened the door and they came for him. And he boldly, without complaint, walked up the gallows and breathed his last. I don't know, some of you may have seen I sent out a little blurb and I've gotten some good responses. My Vietnam vet buddy, Roy, uh, you remember, Pastor, you met Roy and uh, and uh, his wife, uh, oh, yeah. Big Roy. Yeah. Big Roy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he wrote back in, because I, I said, I just wonder if on that occasion, 70 years ago, last Thursday, if, if perhaps Jesus did for Bonhoeffer what he did for Stephen. Mm -hmm. When Stephen could see up into heaven, and Jesus stood up. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. To welcome mm -hmm. him. Amen. I like that. <laughs> Lord, let me be at that place. <laughs> Not that I particularly want to be on the hanging gallows, but as uh, rapidly as some things have been deteriorating in our country, that will be something that becomes a reality sooner than we think. He always leads us in triumph. Was John the Baptizer defeated when his head was separated from his body because of an arrogant king? No. He was victorious in that. Was Bonhoeffer defeated when he was on those gallows? <coughs> he was a man who risked everything that he had to stand for what was right and to stand against evil. And God welcomed him. God who always leads us in triumph in Christ's name and in the kingdom of the heavens we always win over the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. When we enter into battle. You know, you, when you go to Ephesians 6 and you have described for you the armor that we put on, there's the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith, which defends us from those fiery darts because this is the battle zone of the enemy. You know, there's no place in the Bible that says take your sword and cut people to shreds with it. <laughs> we put on the armor, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness which is given to us. The righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us. Having feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, knowing God's word that we can share it with other people. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the shield of faith. We show up and we win. <laughs> That's a heck of a battle plan. Isn't that some kind of battle plan? You just get yourself prepared and you show up and God says, watch me. Deliver you. <laughs> because He says the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. <laughs> we always triumph in Christ. And verse 14 goes on and said, And he manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of him in every place. What's he talking about? Well, he says, verse 15, we're a fragrance of Christ to God. We smell like Jesus to God the Father. Why? Because we have set Rick Luster being Lord over his life, I've chosen to set that aside and I have set Jesus in that place of control as Lord in my life. 
Do I, per, do I perform that per, perfectly 100%? No. But that's the objective. That's where I'm going. And when I let Jesus be in control, I smell like Jesus as an aroma to God. So do you. Every time you die to yourself and you allow Him to be alive in you. Amen. 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 He says we're a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, an aroma from death to death. We smell like death to those who are being controlled by the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. I have met people who instantly hated me, never seen them before in my life. One time, a guy so reacted toward me that after we got outside of the store, the guy said, what did you do to him? I said, I've never seen this guy before in my life. I've never been in this store. I've never met this guy. But I had to smell of Jesus. Which to him, because he's controlled by the powers of darkness, I smell like death. But to those, he says, to those, the other, an aroma of life to life, because we smell like Jesus. And it's refreshing, and it's encouraging, and it's strengthening, and it's empowering. And he says, Who's <laughs> adequate for this? That we could smell like our Lord and Savior Jesus before God the Father. Holy cow, that's a huge responsibility. And yet, that's what He's doing in us. For He says, we are not like many. Not like who, Paul? People who were peddling the Word of God. You know, peddling it like a salesman. We're trying, to, we're trying to get you to buy into our product. No. But we're doing it from sincerity, both as from God. We speak in Christ in the sight of God. He always leads us in triumph, and we give off the aroma of the knowledge of God. <clears throat> you see, he just talked about unforgiveness, and when the enemy reminds us of how, how someone has wronged us, perhaps someone wronged you today, Probably somebody in this room was wrong today by someone that you had better uh, confidence in and fought better of. But when the enemy says, you hold that against them, don't you dare ever trust them again. You know, you know the, the one saying, the world sayings that sometimes are just so despicable in their affront to the Word of God. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Not in the kingdom of the heavens, that's not the way it is. If your brother sins against you and asks forgiveness seven times, you forgive him. Or 70 times. Or 140 times. Or 280 times. Because Jesus said 70 times 7, that's 490 times. You see, in the kingdom of the heavens, you've been hurt. Somebody needs your help. You take that risk again. But see, you've got to be discerning. Because sometimes they're just a stumbling block from the enemy coming against you. And that's when you have to stand up and say, no. You see, when Paul and Silas were arrested because they cast the demon out of the girl and the people were going to lose their business because she couldn't fortune tell anymore. You know, remember she was following around kept saying, These men are servants of the most high God. Be sure to pay attention to listen to what this went on for three days. And he finally rebuked the spirit and cast it out. And then the people that she couldn't fortune tell for now, they trumped up a bunch of lies and they get them beaten and uh, shackled and chained and thrown down, thrown down in the jail in Philippi. And all they had to do was say, We're Romans. And the whole thing would have stopped. Amen. The beating, Amen. Amen. the shackles, the chains, the imprisonment, all of it would have stopped. But Paul knew he was to be silent. See, there are times where they fool you once and you know that they're going to do it again and you are silent and you lay down your life. The next day, they heard that they were Romans and they were all scared. Oh dear, this was illegal. We could, this is not, we could be thrown in prison for this. I tell them to go away. And the next day, Paul wasn't silent. Of course, you remember that night 
God sent the most unique earthquake, made the shackles and chains fall off of him, the prison bars fell open, and the jailer was going to kill himself because if they escaped, it was his life for theirs. And Paul said, don't harm, don't harm yourself, we're all here. So it wasn't just Paul and Silas, apparently the other guys in the jail were listening too. By the way, that's the kind of reputation Dietrich Bonhoeffer had while he was in prison for those two and a half years in three or four different places. Mm -hmm. Became the model prisoner. Amen, amen, mm -hmm. amen. How about that? He was kind even to the guards. Some of them were pretty evil. And they were felt guilty and had changes of heart later. So God was at work in the middle of all that. But see, on this day, Paul knew God said, okay, now it's time to speak. He said, oh, you've beaten us with whips, with rods. You've imprisoned us without a trial, be Romans. No, sir, we're not leaving unless you city fathers yourselves come down here and ask us to. We're standing right here. And they all came down. Now, why did he put them to shame like that the next day? Because he was in tune with the Lord. The day before, he knew God was saying, be silent. And what was the end result? The prisoners got saved and the jailer and his whole family came to the Lord because Paul and Silas didn't take the exit and the way out that was their right to. They were silent. And because of their imprisonment, God did the most amazing thing and people's lives were transformed. But the next day, they, they held their feet to the fire and said, no, you come down here and personally ask us to go because we can have you thrown in jail for what you did. They came down humbly and said, oh, we're sorry, please. And they said, please go away. And they said, well, okay, we're going to go hang out with the jailer first. We're going to have teach him some scripture and share the word of God. And we're going to rejoice with them and then we'll head on out of town. <laughs> How did he know the difference? Because he was in tune with what God was saying. And that, as we live, learn to live in the kingdom of the heavens, that's where we live. In that beautiful place. Yeah. We are the aroma. Christ to God. When we forgive people and, and, and they ask of us and we give, it's like we're reaching up to God saying, God, I take more pleasure in pleasing you than I do in defending myself against somebody who might take advantage of me or steal some of my property or someone who's wrong with me. I forgive them, God. And that's when we give off the fragrance of Jesus. Take a sniff. There's a fragrance of Jesus here tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody just stink a little bit, then just <laughs> repent, okay? <laughs> right? Just repent. And He'll forgive you. Mm -hmm. And be prepared for the next challenge so that we can give off the aroma. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. I want to press on to this next uh, little segment here. Um... Uh, about the, the predominance of the uh, kingdom of the heavens over the kingdom of darkness. Absolutely. <coughs> In uh, Luke chapter 9 is when Jesus appointed the, the 12 apostles to go out. And He appointed them to go and preach the gospel and to heal the sick and to cast out demons. Which is again showing the kingdom of the heavens superiority over the kingdom of darkness. And uh, you can go back and read, uh, read all of the details about it. <coughs> he gave him some specific uh, he gave him some specific commands in Luke 9 verse 6. And departing, they began going out among the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everyone. And so uh, in chapter 10, Verse 1, now after this the Lord appointed 70 others. And He sent them two and two ahead of Him to every city and place where He was going to come. Listen to this interesting statement. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And so, <clears throat> we have right here Jesus telling us that the harvest is plentiful. Now, if you think people in the Florence area aren't interested in the things of God, I want you to know Jesus says you're mistaken. The harvest is plentiful. 
In one place he says, the fields are already white on the harvest. The grain was beginning to mature. He said, we need laborers to go out and to gather it in. And folks, that's going on right now. And you need to be stepping up to that place of learning how God wants to use you to reach out. It doesn't mean that you have to go take your Bible and stand on uh, the corner of Butte and Main Street down here and be yelling at everybody, uh, you know, things out of the Scripture. There are ways that God has designed for us to go out and to help influence the people that are hungry. Mostly by looking for and reaching out to people who are in need and, and those, and especially in different times of crisis, where we have the opportunity to help people. When everything's going smooth, a lot of people are not interested in the things of God. But when the crisis comes, you get their attention. <laughs> God gets their attention. And that's where we need to be available to help. And uh, the problem is that, you know, sometimes we're not discerning about how God is and where He is working. So, uh, he, he says in verse 3, Go we wait. I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And then he gives specifics. Don't take a bunch of extra bags and everything. And uh, go and stay in the home. And, and whatever they give you, you receive that. Or the laborer is worthy of his wages. Verse 7 says. How about that? And, um, and he said in verse 8, Whatever city you enter, they receive you. Eat what's that before you? In verse 9, heal those that enter sick. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And if they don't receive you, then uh, tell them as you shake dust off your feet, be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near to you. In other words, you've missed your opportunity. <laughs> well, in verse 17, John, uh, Luke reports for us here. And these are getting to the verses that are specifically on your list tonight. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That is the dominion of the kingdom of the heavens. The power of the kingdom of the heavens over the kingdom of darkness. They came back saying, look, even the demons are subject to us in your name. These were seventy young disciples. These were not people who... You know, who are experts have been with, you know, been with Jesus for years and been involved in all the things that are going on. A lot of these were new believers. And yet they went out. And they came back and said, Jesus, this is so awesome. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. Listen to how Jesus responds in verse 18. And he says to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now don't miss this. <laughs> All through the scripture, Satan has access to the throne room of God. Mm -hmm. And you can go back and see the different places where he comes and he is present before God the Father in the throne room of the heavenly temple, or not of the heavenly temple, but the heavenly throne room of God. Job chapter 1, Satan came when God was having this meeting. Job chapter 2, he's there again. Zechariah chapter 3, he's there again because he's accusing the, the Zechariah the high priest. And in Luke chapter 10, he may have been in heaven for another one of those meetings and he had no idea that Jesus in setting up the kingdom of the heavens here on the earth was going to allow all of his power and all of his deeds to be done by those who become citizens of his kingdom. And Satan fell like lightning back to the earth to set up opposition to Amen. Amen. the forward movement of the kingdom of the heavens. Amen. That was 2,000 years ago he began his opposition to the kingdom of the heavens. Especially as his dominion in people's lives was being overruled and overpowered by the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the heavens. What kind of things do you suppose he came up with to oppose the kingdom of the heavens? How about this one? We're not in here. <laughs> That's one of the biggest tools an enemy can have is stealth. If they don't know that they're operating, they operate freely. 
<coughs> in one of the three attempts to kill Hitler that Bonhoeffer was and his family were involved in, they actually got a, a British-made bomb on a plane that Hitler was on. And the reason they wanted to use a British timer was because the German timers made noises. And the British had come up with a way that acid would eat through and trigger the mechanism and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the trigger would go off that would ignite the explosive. And what this fellow did was he gave him this box and said, hey, you're going on the plane. When you get to that town, I lost a bet to this guy taking his toe. Well, he had started the timer. They put it in there and they're waiting to hear the news that the planes exploded midair. And that Hitler, and I believe Himmler, and, and uh, one of the other just uh, horrible leaders of the Nazis were all in the plane. Turned out it was a dud. Malfunction. So when they come back, they think, oh no, they're going to discover that I put a bomb on there and they're going to know that we've been plotting. But they didn't. They hadn't even opened it and said, uh, I've started to give it to this fellow and he said that uh, it wasn't him, so here's your gift back. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the next time they used a similar bomb that was in the briefcase. And the fellow went into the meeting and as he went into the meeting, the timer took about 10 minutes for the acid to eat through and allow the trigger of them to detonate the explosive. But where the briefcase was sitting, the fellow had the timer going, he slipped out, it did explode, but a piece of furniture from the big conference table where they were deflected the main part of the blast. Hitler's pants were ripped to shreds, people died all around him. That he survived again. And of course, that's when they began tracking down who was doing this. And that's when Bonhoeffer's brother-in-law was arrested, and he was arrested, and, and, and then ultimately all the rest of their families were arrested. Uh, uh, some 100 people involved and family members. And a number of them uh, were executed, but a number of them did survive. What I'm saying is this. <coughs> the enemy uh, the enemy is scheming and, he's, and Satan is working to thwart the plan. When they can operate without the Nazis knowing they were making this attempt, they had a much better chance of succeeding and, and killing them. When Satan can operate and people don't know that he's out there, or they believe the lie, yeah. We're not in here. Then that allows them free reign. But tonight we're exposing the kingdom of darkness for what they are doing and where the battlefield is. It's right here. In your thoughts. That's how they bombard us. Trying to get us to receive their temptation and their thoughts and agree with it so that it, began, it can begin to manifest in us. So Jesus said in verse 18, Luke 10, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And then he says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now wait a minute. What does this have to do with, with snakes and bugs? Jesus is speaking in a parable again. Jesus was always speaking in parables. In fact, one place says he didn't say anything without speaking in a parable, but he privately explained their meaning to his disciples when he was alone with them. And so I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy so that nothing should injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. In what, Jesus? In what I just told you. What did you just tell us, Jesus? Listen, here it is. Straightforward language. That the spirits are subject to you. To us who are citizens of the kingdom of the heavens. The spirits of the powers of darkness are subjected to us in Jesus' name. Now he said, don't rejoice in this and that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. 
In other words, don't lose perspective about what really is important. Yes, I'm glad you've learned you can lay hands on the sick and pray for them. And if it's a spirit that's causing somebody to be sick, you can cast it out in my name. That's great. But don't lose perspective. Rejoice that your name's recorded in heaven because the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the remission of your sins. See, we have to keep perspective on that. And so when we walk with God, we're not ever going to put up a big banner that says deliverance ministry. Come get your demons cast out. We're not going to hang a banner that says healing ministry. Come and get healed with your sickness. No. Deliverance from the powers of darkness and, and being healed of physical ailments is just part of what Jesus does when Jesus is allowed to be himself. Some places he's not allowed to be himself. Some churches don't allow Jesus to be Jesus. Bonhoeffer was horrified at what the Lutheran church had become mm -hmm. in his day. And he made it known publicly. He said Luther would be appalled at what is passing off as part of the Reformation movement that he helped to begin in Germany. Just 300 years, 400 years earlier. You see, we don't rejoice in this, but we learn how to be equipped and to be tools useful in the domination of the kingdom of the heavens over the kingdom of darkness. And then, Jesus didn't just stop there. Re rejoice, your name's recorded in heaven. And at that very time, and this isn't on the list, but, uh, oh yeah, it's okay, good. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is really happy about this. That we, his children, are learning about the authority and power we have over the enemy in his name. And he rejoiced greatly and he said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and intelligent. What things? The dominion of the kingdom of the heavens over the powers of darkness. That when somebody is being tempted to take their own life, in Jesus' name, we can cast that out. Good. In Jesus' name. Amen. That when someone is sick, if that sickness is caused by a spirit, we can bind it and command it to get out. In Jesus' name. And if they're sick otherwise, in Jesus' name, they can be healed. Good news. He said, I've hidden this from the smart people, from the wise and intelligent. So, Rick, are you saying we're all stupid if we believe this? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. You see, the wise and intelligent are the ones who think they're smarter than everybody else. And so Jesus just calls them the wise and intelligent. They're too smart for that. In fact, a lot of people, teachers of theology, pastors in America would be offended if we really believe that this Jesus describes is really what he means. <laughs> no. They're really, there may be some over you know, in India or somewhere, but they're offended. See, it's hidden from those who are not humble enough to receive God's truth. He said, you hid it from the wise and intelligent and you revealed it to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in your sight, and all things have been handed over to me. The kingdom of the heavens. Jesus said, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. When would Jesus reveal who the Father is? When your heart is humble and contrite? When you repent of your sin, admit your brokenness, and you cry out to God for His mercy and for His grace? Then He wills to reveal it. That's why He was still speaking in parables. And and he went on a verse, the next verse and said, and turning to the disciples, he said, 
privately to them. Blessed are the eyes that see the things you see. So there were many prophets and kings wished to see what you see and didn't see it, and to hear the things you hear. And didn't hear it. He said, you are blessed. I'm here to tell you tonight, if God showed you things in the Scripture as we open up our Bibles and study together in this humble little gathering here, if you're getting something, it's because Jesus is revealing it to you. Because the Son reveals the light and the truth and who the Father is to those who humbly seek. We need to be counted among those. And so the 70 learned about that power and that authority that we have in Jesus' name. Let's look at one other passage here. Let's, let's go to the Matthew 12. We have been over part of this previously, but... I think now it might mean a little bit more to you than it did previously. Matthew 12 is where we're going to wrap things up this evening. <laughs> Two verses here. Matthew chapter 12. This is, a, this is the place where, and starting at verse 22, there was brought to Jesus a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb. He was blind and he could not speak. And he healed him. No, 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 no. no if, if there are fires of darkness there... Jesus cast them out. Well, it's interesting. In this place, He said, He healed them. And other, several other places, the Scripture says that Jesus healed people of demons. Well, how do we know if we're healing them of a sickness or we're healing them of a demon? Well, the answer is simple to that. I don't know. I don't. We just need God to show us. But He's told us Lay hands on the sick and they will recover because I work with you and I confirm the word with the signs that come after. And that's what we're experiencing. That's why we've had testimonies from people tonight. God touching them just in the last week and healing their bodies. You said, well, but Rick, you've been fighting sickness for three weeks. Yeah, I have. Worse than about ten years. Well, then... How come you've been sick? Listen, healing doesn't come from Rick. I'm a recipient of it, okay? And I have had been a recipient of it. And little things like bronchitis and things like headaches and stuff, but also some big things like heart problem and kidney stones. And God healed me and I wasn't in the hospital. I mean, people laid hands on and prayed for me. And God healed me. And it's a good thing. I'm not the one who's doing the healing. I am a recipient and one in need of it just as we all are. When we live in the kingdom of the heavens, that's part of what He affords us. And we need each other to minister to each other in this way. It was the most beautiful thing the first time that I experienced physical healing being prayed for. I was another laryngitis deal. But this was the worst laryngitis I'd had my whole life. Literally for three days, I could not speak. To get anything out, I'd have to push hard with the diaphragm, get lots of airflow, and i go. And I'm rebuking things and standing against it and crying out to God and praising Him. And <laughs> A friend needed me to haul some stuff for his construction business out to 29 Palms. I drove all the way out there praying. In fact, I picked up a couple of hitchhikers and had this Bible. I laid it over there. And I'm uh, uh, turning the pages and telling him, read that. And then turn some more pages and tell him, read that. And turn some more pages and tell him, read that. And you know, and I'm sharing what I can because I couldn't read it out loud. And I stopped by some friend's house over in Peoria. Now, a fellow who had been the, one of the deacons in First Southern Baptist Church in Mesa when I was pastor there, he and his wife. And I went in and I said, and they said, well, sit down in the rocking chair. And uh, Mr. and Ms. Pewitt. And I said, would you lay hands on me and pray with me? Well, they're both kind of humble, quiet sort of people. And they, they just soon not pray out loud, even if it's just a crowd of three. <clears throat> so they're just agreeing with me. And I started praying. And as I prayed, over a period of 10, 12 minutes, I was completely restored. Amen. 
Like for three days I've been praying and nothing's happening and now i got two people agreeing with me and boom, I'm getting healed. I'm like, whoa. You know? Why did God design it that way? That's part of the kingdom of the heavens. Is you need to understand that you need your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. We Amen. learn from one another and as iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens man and we get better and we move on in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And by the way, we might even get healed if we'll get our brothers and sisters and we'll humble ourselves and say, hey, I need you, I need you to pray for me. So I had to stop and buy some gas in the gas station. So I go in, I was going to put 10 bucks in and, uh, <coughs> and I went in and I and I had I said, I need ten. Then the guy jumps back at the counter. Because <laughs> I've been pushing so hard with the diaphragm muscle to be able to say anything. I wanted to tell him, I need ten bucks on pump three. And I got out there and I started laughing. And it's one of only a couple times in my life that I experienced laughing in the spirit. Driving from Peoria all the way across Phoenix back to my in-laws' place over in Mesa. And I was laughing so hard, I was pounding on the steering wheel, just rejoicing and grateful to God that He would touch me and heal me. And when I showed up, <laughs> my wife and my family were stunned. Oh no, my boys probably thought Dad's got his voice back. <laughs> <laughs> and so, here we are in Matthew 12. And He says, <clears throat> He healed him. So the dumb man spoke and saw all the multitude were amazed and began to say, oh, this man can't be the son of David, can he? You know, buy a vow, guys. You think? Maybe, huh? Might be a sign, an indication of God here? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man cast out demons only by the bills of all the ruler of the demons and knowing their thoughts. How did Jesus know their thoughts? Oh, well, Jesus was God, so he knew everything. Ah, wrong answer. You need to mature in your understanding about Jesus. Jesus was fully and totally man. And that's why the most common term that Jesus used in reference to Himself is... Son of Man. Son of Man. That's what Jesus called Himself. Mm -hmm. They say, you're the Son of God. Well, yeah, that's true, but Son of Man. Jesus knew their thoughts. That's a word of knowledge, just like the Holy Spirit will give us words of knowledge when we're trying as participants in the kingdom of the heavens to help minister to somebody to get them healed of sickness or delivered from uh, sickness, from sin or addictions or whatever. And so, knowing their thoughts, he said, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Any city divided and a house divided against itself shall not stand. In verse 26, and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall his kingdom stand? But, Jesus always put it in the form of a question, but if I cast out those of them, uh, if, if, I, if I by Bilzebul cast out demons, verse 27, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, we don't know exactly the background on this, but apparently some of either their own physical sons or their children, uh, speaking of people in their congregations, were learning about this power and the kingdom of the heavens and were casting them out. He said, but... By whom do your sons cast them out? So, you understand what I'm saying? He may have been referring physically to their own children. Uh, more likely, he's referring to their sons, meaning those who uh, were in their congregation. That's probably more likely what he's referring to, but it could be either one. Uh, we don't have enough information here to know clearly. Consequently, he says, they'll be your judges. But if... And we could... Uh, talk about the Greek second class conditional sentence here and we could say but since instead of if if I cast out the are you impressed that I knew all of them about the second, Greek second class conditional sentence I just wanted to be dazzled with the, word, really. <coughs> the reason I know about this is because my brother-in-law's dad wrote his doctoral dissertation when he got his doctor of theology on the Greek second class conditional sentence. So that's the reason I didn't know anything about that. So be impressed. Um, okay. So we're all bedazzled here. Okay. But if or since I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, verse 28, then the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens has come upon you. If I cast out demons, look at it again, by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of the heavens has fallen upon you. 
one of the signs of the presence of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the heavens is that the power of Satan is broken, the power of the kingdom of darkness is overcome by the light. So you can say, since I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come on you. And by the way, how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Then he'll plunder his property. And he's talking about taking authority over the kingdom of darkness and kicking them out of people's lives and out of their bodies. And then he says, Who's, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And then he goes on down, and if you'll jump down to verse 43, he gives us another great insight here. Verse 43. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest. Notice, these agents of the kingdom of the darkness, of darkness, do not have their own physical body to which to be attached. That's why they desire to have the right to be attached to your body. And when they are not in a physical body, they are not at rest. They are in torment. Amen, amen, amen. And so their desire is to have the right to park in your container. This is what Jesus is showing us here. Don't miss this. The unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places. Waterless places are places where the Spirit of God and the Word of God are absent. Amen, amen, amen. Good. The Bible has talked about the, the, the Scripture being, the, we need to be washed in the water with the Word. The Spirit of God is the moisture. Remember the parable of the soils, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8? What happened to the seed that fell in the soil where it had no moisture? It sprang up and then died. And that moisture is the Holy Spirit and the Word. The Word being moistened and coming to life because of the Holy Spirit. So, the, the unclean spirits are going to places where the Holy Spirit are not. And he's seeking rest. He doesn't find it because he doesn't have a body to be attached to. Then it says, I'll return to my house, which we know is a man. How do we know that? Because we read verse 43. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to my house, this man, from which I came out. And when he comes, it finds it unoccupied. It's empty. Even though it's swept and it's put in order, why is it all cleaned out? Because the unclean spirit of the powers of darkness has been kicked out. But he comes back, and that house is not filled with the Word of God, or with the Spirit of God, or the deeds of Jesus. And so it's empty, and therefore susceptible to occupation by enemy forces. <laughs> then it goes in. Takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Did you get the picture here? You see, <coughs> we'll have to go back to our little study about the children's bread. So we can't do that tonight. There's not enough time. But we're, we'll go back and look at the children's bread again. You see, if a person is not walking with God, their heart's not turned to God, why would you cast the powers of darkness out of their life? If they're not going to be filled with the Word and with Jesus. They're better off to keep the powers of darkness that controlled them. They're better off to keep them than they are to kick them out and get it clean if they're not going to walk with God. Because He's going to collect a bunch of His buddies and come back and their last condition is going to be worse than the first. Now, I told a story about the man we prayed for one night who we went into his house and he had the, he had the telephone and a bottle of Jim Beam, thing called the fifth, and it was about two-thirds of it was gone. 
and then he had a loaded 38 and he said he couldn't decide whether to call for help uh, down to, to our church or to use the phone to just kill himself. And, and you remember me telling the story that we're praying for him, we're not really getting anywhere, and all of a sudden God gave me a word of knowledge and I saw in my mind the image of his mother-in-law, who I had met on two occasions that had been more than 10 years before. I didn't know her name, but I remembered seeing her because she had visited church with us in Mesa some 10 years before. And that's when I told him, you need to forgive your mother-in-law. And that's when he snapped and he was on his knees and we were trying, you know, praying, trying to help him. And he looked at me and he said, how did you know about that? I said, just God, that's all. And you recall that he did. He said, you know, I was never good enough to be married to her daughter. She hated me the whole time. She worked against me all along. And I said, brother, you know, I'm sorry that happened. But unless you forgive her, then God can't get control in your life and you're not going to overcome this alcohol problem. And he broke and he began to weep and he, and he forgave her. And when he finished, boom, he was completely sober. Fantastic. He actually took off work. He was a manager of a grocery store. He took off work and he went with a group of us that were going to Redding, California where I was teaching a weekend Bible conference. And he went all the way up there, spent the week in the Word. He was just really great. And then the last time I heard from him, a couple of years later, he thought he was fine now. He had a handle on the drinking thing. And one night he had something to drink and he went into a grocery store. And in the meantime, by the way, he started drinking again, lost his position as a grocery store manager. He came to the front, nobody was there, so he went out to the car. Started ordering groceries in the car without paying for them. And the manager and someone else came out and he had a pistol in his car and he grabbed his pistol. Oh. So they backed off. And of course, it wasn't very long before they pulled him over and arrested him. And he went to prison for armed robbery. Now that's the rest of the story that I didn't get to go into before. And why do you need to know the rest of the story? Because if you're not going to walk with God, you might as well have a good time with the powers of darkness that control you now. But this man did choose to repent and God did set him free and he went back and that spirit came back and brought seven more wicked and himself in his last condition was worse than the first and he wind up he winds up going to prison. You see, folks, these are not idle words we're reading. This is real life. Yes it is. Amen. And God's serious about his word. And if you want to get in on his kingdom, it's the most exciting thing you can experience in this world. But we're in a real war with a real enemy who hides in obscurity and actually disguises himself as you and your thoughts sometimes. That's how cunning he mm. is. But in the kingdom of the heavens, the word of God exposes them and you can have victory over them. But don't be playing games. You might have been playing games when you went and joined church sometime. This isn't like joining church. You're not going to be faking it and playing games. You're going to get into the kingdom of the heavens. Because it's life and death. It's real. Okay. It's serious. Amen. But on the other hand, there's no greater joy. And we have example after example of men and women of God who have no regrets Amen. devoting their lives to Jesus. Amen. Seventy years ago, last week, when Dietrich Bonhoeffer went up and was hanged for the stand that he took and for standing for truth and right, he had no regrets. John the baptizer, the day they removed his head from his body, he had no regrets. Bonhoeffer said, I'd do it all over again. I still would leave America and go back and try to stop this evil and suffer with God's people that were suffering in Germany and try to stop this. Only one of the twelve disciples of Jesus live to die a natural death. Amen, amen, amen. And all the others, it cost them their life to be in the kingdom of the heavens. <clears throat> no regrets. No regrets. Lord, thank you tonight for your word. It is
gives life to those who find it. It's medication to our bones, healing to our body, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Thank you, you've appointed angels mighty in strength to watch over your word and perform. And what a privilege and joy to live in the kingdom of the heavens right here in heaven. The Lord, may we count the cost. Realize it's not a game. This is real life. What a joy to join in and have the resources of God who created this universe available and accessible to us little human beings. Thank you, God, for that. Yeah. What an amazing thing that you would choose us. Set your affection on us and so bless us with your presence and power. And you said you'd never leave us or forsake us. Whether we're facing death or just difficulties in this life or financial trials or physical difficulties or problems with family, relationships, God, whatever it is, He said you never leave. That's what He says. We thank You for that. We reach out to You tonight and we say, yes, Lord, we want that. We want to receive those benefits and share, yes, even share in the sufferings of Jesus that we might become partakers of this life. Thank you for that, Lord. Urge us on our growth in knowing you.